Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from today. This is Tim Crawford, and we are here to talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, today's webinar is titled, Practical Approaches to Move Artificial Intelligence from a Black Box to a Strategic Asset, a common issue that many enterprises have. Um, so to kind of kick us off and set the tone for our conversation today, um, I'm joined by a couple of panelists from Sap Publicist Sapient, uh, Rashed Hawk and Nitin Agarwal. Rashed, Nitin, would you like to introduce yourselves? Rashed? Thank you, Tim. Uh, this is Rashed Hawk. I'm the global lead for AI and robotics at uh, Publicist Sapient. And uh, over the last five years, I've been working with uh, many Fortune 500 companies, helping them to build their uh, AI capability as a strategic asset. So I'm uh, glad to be talking about it today. Great. Thanks, Rashad. Great to have you. Nitin. Hi, uh, Nitin Agrawal. Um, I am the uh, India lead for the AI and data practice for uh, Publicis Sapient. Um, and over the last five years, I've worked with several clients in uh, um, asset management space, financial services space, as well as uh, uh, energy services firms, um, you know, building their uh, data engineering as well as analytics platforms. Great. Thanks, Nit. And I'm Tim Crawford, head of research for GigaOM Research and your moderator and host for today's webinar. So just to kind of tee us up, let's talk about artificial intelligence. It's one of the hottest topics today and has the ability to provide significant business value. Yet most are still challenged with the fact that AI is more of a black box and it's not well understood. People are trying to leverage AI to support strategic initiatives and it does bring significant value to some firms. So we need to delve into that a little further. What is that path that enterprises can take for strategic success? And does it navigate through a couple of U-turns and right turns and left turns, or is it somewhat straight? I'd venture a little hint there, it's probably not that straight. So let's talk about the approach. Let's talk about the solutions. Let's talk about how enterprises can bring some light to this black box and talk about leveraging AI for strategic advantage. So with that, let's dive into our first question. But before I jump into the first question, I want to encourage audience participants to submit your questions through the GoToWebinar control panel. Submit them there, we'll be able to see them, and we'll bring your questions into the conversation so that you can get those addressed uh, straightforward. So with our first question, what are some of the drivers behind AI's black box perception? How why why do people think that this is such a black box? Why is it not well understood? Rashad, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, and you know I think that uh, a part of that is we're transitioning uh, from a paradigm where software was created by uh, humans actually coding the logic uh, to now where we provide uh, the data to a machine and the machine comes up with the logic. Uh, for, through machine learning and uh, that based on the data that the machine is seeing. And when that logic is developed, it's not easy for us to see how it will behave in every situation. And uh, sometimes the, uh, even when we, when we can tell in a mathematical way, that's not easily uh, interpretable by business users. Uh, because because it is mathematical in, in nature. And so, so then you get these, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead and finish your thought, please. Uh, I was gonna say, so then you get uh, these situations where you can, uh, where the model makes a recommendation, the AI model, uh, or makes a decision, and then it's, you don't have a good way to query it to understand why it said what it said. But what I was going to interject there is these models are not developed in a vacuum. These models are developed by people, by humans. How how do we start to to kind of bridge that gap? Is this a matter matter of the people who are leveraging the models are different than the people who are building the models, and so therefore there's a kind of a lack of translation there, or are the models learning themselves, and so the machines become 
the learners, knit and feel free to jump in on this too. And, and I think that it, it's a little of both. I think the, the main thing is that as a group, we have to build the intuition to understand how these things are working. And I, I think over time that will uh, very likely come, but there is a set of things that need to uh, ha happen in the process. Nathan, do you want to add something? Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I just wanted to kind of add to what Rashid said. Um, so basically, if you look at uh, look at it, ML algorithms, uh, you know, they didn't. Uh, they actually are built on top of the data that you provide to it, right? Um, so it's it, nothing but a um, you know a, a, it uh, you know it's it's just a complex function, um, you know, mostly uh, non-linear, uh, you know, non monotonic, uh, it's a non polynomial, uh, and in a lot of cases, non, non continuous as well, right? So it, it becomes a bit difficult um, to kind of establish why model has predicted, predicted why it has predicted. Right, um, and it's 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 uh, typically very important in uh, in uh, in couple of industries like uh, finance and healthcare to understand uh, why a model has predicted what it has predicted. Um, it is also important um, wherever um, you know the trust on the model has to be established, uh, and it has not been established yet. Right, uh, so in those cases also um, understanding uh, why a model is predicting what it is predicting is important. Um, you know, there are situations wherein um, you know uh, we we need interpretability uh, to uh, debug the models because you know um, you know correlation is 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 not co uh, you know causality, right? So you need to uh, you need to differentiate these uh, elements. Um, so you know, in, in, in just just to give you give you an example, right? Uh, in one of the situations, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you know there was a model uh, developed for um, you know, uh, pneumonia patients um, in terms of uh, whether they should be admitted to the hospital or not. Now, you know, uh, you know, when when the model was being built at that point in time, it was felt that neural nets is a good idea to kind of uh, use as a technique to build that model, right? Um, however, um, just purely because of higher levels of accuracy that you can achieve with neural nets, um, but doctors really want to understand the thinking behind uh, the algo, right? Yeah. Um, so statisticians actually then um, you know came up with uh, you know a, 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 you know a, 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 a corresponding um, decision rules um, that, that used uh, regression methods, right? Um, and, and because regression methods use uh, linear um, you know linear techniques, uh, they were more, they are more interpretable. Now you know in both the cases, model inter indicated that people uh, patients uh, pneumonia patients who have asthma they have a lower risk of dying. Uh, yeah. And hence, they should not be admitted. Now, it's very counterintuitive. It, it's it's uh, clinically counterintuitive, and that's the reason uh, we were able to catch um, that that nuance, that issue with the model, right? Because we uh, we try to bring in interpretability by using a surrogate uh, model approach, right? Okay. And you know, if we had not done that, then you know, um, you know, the model could have led to a situation wherein um, you know uh, patients that have asthma as well as pneumonia they wouldn't have been admitted in the hospital. So it's very risky as well in some cases. Um, you know, wherein the, uh, wherever the models uh, have opacity, um, and and uh, we absolutely need to understand uh, where the model is coming from. So that that's a that's a great way to start off this conversation. And it kind of gets to our second question, um, which is really focused on the enterprise perspective of the black box and how they can deal with this black box. Um, and as part of this, I, I want to, again, encourage folks. I see some questions starting to come in, which is great. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, and we'll infuse your questions in as we go through the conversation. But what are some ways that enterprises um, can deal with this black box? So we're here, you've, each of you have kind of talked about the challenges around it, but should you just accept the fact that it's a black box if you're an enterprise? Should you start to understand how that model was built? What do you suggest? Uh, it, you know, there's uh, one, uh, in addition to the block back, I mean the block, the 
black box issue. There's another issue, which is that the algorithms or models are very literal, and the two together is part of what causes the uh, some some of the concerns and challenges. And you know, when, when I say that algorithms are literal, what I mean is that they just do what you ask it to do, or or in the case of machine learning, they just do what uh, they've learned to do. So in that case, they're uh, sometimes greedy, sometimes short-sighted, like greedy meaning even if there is a very small benefit, uh, it will take you through some convoluted process to uh, capture that benefit. And, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the way that companies have been uh, handling this, the ones that are uh, scaling up their AI capability and model building, uh, there's two two types of things that they do. The first one is before going into the modeling process or as they're going into the modeling process, uh, they try to use a diverse set of uh, objectives uh, in the modeling itself, right? So, so if you think about uh, somebody who's trying to increase their ad click-throughs, right, they can optimize for that but uh, in that process, they will get a lot of uh, uh, junk ads and create uh, this uh, click, clickbait situation, right? Mm -hmm. So if you change your objective to not just click-throughs, but something that uh, is closer to user satisfaction, which is so long as it's measurable, then uh, that helps. So that's that's one side before the modeling. The, uh, the other side uh, is post-modeling, uh, which something Nathan was uh, referring to, which is being able to do pragmatic interpretability and based on that uh, fairness or model compliance testing, right? So you can, uh, you can think of interpretability as uh, enabling the user to uh, meaningfully combine their uh, prior knowledge with the model's information, right? So it may not necessarily allow you to actually understand the mechanics of the model, but it allows you to create intuition around it. And you know, in a way, it goes back to uh, how we learn to do everything, right? So if you look at drug testing, uh, we've been using aspirin for 50, 70 years. Uh, but we've on, it's only in 2009 that we figured out why it does what it does. But uh, we tested it for safety and we tested it for, you know, does it work or not? Meaning, does it perform? So, so in a way, we've uh, uh, vetted it a little bit and also built some intuition that if X, then take this drug, right? So uh, this kind of model interpretability uh, I think will also go along those lines. So I, I want to ask a couple of clarifying pieces there. Um, one is, is is the problem here that as enterprises, we are, when we go into this this conversation around building a model or building an algorithm that you, you mentioned about how it's so literal, but are we focused on outcomes that are maybe too narrow? We're trying to get too specific of what we're trying to achieve. Do you think that's part of the problem is how we, you did talk about how we think about it, but um, that we're focused too narrow on what the outcome is? Uh, yeah, in, in a way, that's, the, that's part of the literalness issue, which is, uh, the algorithms don't have common sense, right? So, yeah. where it, so you can't really treat them like a like a employee. You have to make it uh, have all these collective objectives uh, beyond just the specific thing you say. And so, part of that is creating the diversity of objectives. Part of that is making sure that there's enough data, enough breadth of data uh, so that it learns the, the US military first started using machine learning to detect uh, to detect tanks uh, they all the training data was based on daytime images and then when they tried to test it for the first time in the field which was at night uh, the algorithm didn't detect any uh, tanks 
right? Mm. So because they didn't have the diversity of data. So, so it's those things that will help uh, broaden that uh, perspective, right? Quote unquote, give it some common sense. And I want to ask a, a kind of side question to this, and Nit, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Is I'm hearing this undercurrent of trust and needing to trust, and maybe that's, or maybe that's the question I should be asking: is is trust a factor in? why folks are concerned about this black box. And to your aspirin example, maybe we should just trust that it's going to do what it needs to do. And down the road, we'll figure out how it actually does it. Do you think trust plays a role in this? No, absolutely. I mean, trust uh, is is one of the key elements uh, there, right? Um, because, uh, you know, uh, at times you have to explain, um, um, you know, especially, specifically in financial services uh, uh, space, uh, you need to explain to regulators, right? So explanatory, explain, uh, explainability and interpretability of the model is, is key. Um, trust can also be established uh, by using things like A/B testing, um, if if it's if such is available, right? Uh, if 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 that possibility is there. However, um, it may not always be about trust. Um, you know, uh, you still need to uh, explain to people who who are uh, gonna get impacted because of the decision made by the model. Um, you know, uh, you need to explain to those people as to why um, why model has made certain decision for instance um, you know uh, uh, rejecting while rejecting a loan application right um, now if if uh, uh, to the loan applicant we are not able to explain or tell uh, why the loan application has been rejected then then uh, yeah, it, it leads to kind of bad customer experience right uh, and in some cases uh, regulatory concerns will uh, enforce that um, yeah, you you provide the reason as well right mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So diversity of data, trust, thinking about the outcomes of the models, where does cognitive play a role in this? Um, or does it in, in terms of AI? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it also uh, somewhat depends on the definition of cognitive because it's uh, like AI, it's another term that's not uh, well-defined. But, <laughs> let's uh, define it here. Yeah. We have the floor. Let's define it. <laughs> but I, I think one of the way, like people often tend to distinguish between machine learning and, and cognitive, even though some of the things underlying cognitive may be based on machine learning or deep learning. But the other way to uh, define, uh, oh, not define it, but within cognitive, there's other technologies that you can use. And one of the more important ones, and uh, it also happens to be one of the older ones, pre-machine learning, which is uh, uh, semantic modeling. Mm -hmm. so if you can create an ontology uh, and a semantic model of the thing that you're working on, uh, then you can create uh, a causal, causal reasoning engine, which will, uh, be, because of how it works, it will traverse through the entire logic of uh, uh, the explanation. So, so as, as a simple example, if you do a search on what, is, what was the height of the president when Obama was born, uh, on Google you'll get Obama's height. Uh, but if you give that to a causal reasoning engine, a cognitive engine, it will say uh, Obama was born in 61, Kennedy was the president, Kennedy's height was so and so. Right, and it will give you the correct answer. And there you can see the logic steps that it went through. Hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. So let's let's get into some of those kind of different ancillary components with our next question here, question number three. Um, are there alternative non-machine learning approaches that companies can consider when they're thinking about AI and thinking about tools and th thinking about approaches? Yeah, and so I think this uh, semantic modeling is uh, certainly a, a, a big component of the non-ML field. Uh, I think the other thing that we're seeing is in that uh, what uh, Nitin was calling interpretability, 
that people are using non-machine learning uh, uh, algorithms in that space, which can create uh, local uh, explanations. Right? So the machine learning algorithm may find uh, an explanation for the entire data set, but uh, if you're trying to understand just one data point, you can create a local non-machine learning model that explains just that local area uh, of the data nearby that. So, and, so those types, sensitivity analysis yeah. is another one. Those types of things are in play. Yeah, and just to add to that, right? Um, so so if if you talk about so what's the purpose of ml purpose of ml is to uh, draw uh, inferences from the data right or draw insights from the data now you don't necessarily have to jump uh, to ml to do that right uh, you know we typically start with things like data visualization um, you could use things like uh, glyphs uh, correlation graphs um, you know that can help you uh, understand um, you know the groups of correlated variable identify irrelevant variables you know discover uh, important relationships um, that uh, potentially ml model should incorporate and so on and so forth right so data visualization in my mind uh, is, is it should be the starting point um, that will help you understand the shape of the data, you know the you know the correlations among them, um, and 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 what influences it throws at you, and then um, you know even before we jump onto ML techniques, we should try to use um, you know uh, non ML uh, you know statistical techniques uh, like linear regression, logistic regression, uh, splines, and so on and so forth, right? Um, to see uh, what kind of accuracy you're gonna get, you, you you know that that particular model is giving you. Uh, only in situations wherein some of these statistical techniques uh, are, are limiting uh, from an accuracy standpoint, um, that's when we should start thinking about ML models. Right. And then whenever we are thinking about ML models, um, you know, uh, you know, we, we should uh, ensure that interpretability uh, is, is one of the key design principles while we are building that model. Right. So at every stage, we need to uh, ensure that, um, you know, uh, uh, the model um, is, is evolved, uh, you know, with uh, with interpretability. Interesting. So, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that uh, the flip side is also true in the sense that uh, model accuracy can help a lot. And just because it's not completely interpretable shouldn't mean that we arbitrarily give up on that accuracy, right? In the same way that even though we didn't understand how aspirin worked, we still took it because it worked. Yeah, can you talk about that maybe a little bit deeper in terms of what you mean? Yeah, so, so as an example, if I have a deep learning model that's uh, being used to detect uh, money laundering, it's going to tell me, uh, give me a accuracy, you know, how often it's uh, actually true, and it'll tell me what the false positive and false negative numbers are, and then uh, I can fine tune the model to reduce the false positive, false negative. But in in a way, I may not uh, really understand why it's saying that these people are, are doing money laundering, predicting money laundering, but I can see that every time I then investigate it, it's true. So should I then stop using the model? Probably not. I should probably put some additional governance around it, uh, but uh, we, you know we shouldn't. So that, that's one example where we shouldn't just say because we don't understand why it's saying what it's saying, we're not going to use it at all. But this, correct me if I'm wrong, Rashad. But this is this kind of ties back to what you were talking about in the prior question too, which is thinking beyond just the discrete activity of we're trying to do some form of analysis on a pool of data. Right. We have to think beyond that in terms of how we're going to use it and what are the factors that go into why we're asking that question of the data. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I think the classic example of that that we talk about with every client is you can 
collect data and, for example, advertising uh, to increase sales. And you can see that uh, certain uh, people have a high affinity for alcohol or whiskey, say. But you need to be responsible for putting the filter in saying, if they're under 21, don't advertise alcohol to them. Right. So that so there are some of these how you're going to use it that need to become uh, uh, part of the thinking, even aside from the stuff that goes into the model, mm. which is what I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So I think what I'm taking away from this is advertising to kids under 21 about alcohol is a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, let's let's go on to our next question because I think you you're each of you are touching on this this next question, which is, you know, we we talk about kind of the mechanics of it in a way. Um, we talk about how you think about machine learning, how you think about artificial intelligence, and the relationship between them, and some of these issues of trust and diversity of data, and the models and and the algorithms, and how they're so narrow. Um, but our next question is is really talking about how AI is commonly being used today. So shifting gears in the conversation from talking about the mechanics of it and how you think about it to how people are actually using it today. So are there a couple of examples where, or characterizations even, that you could talk about how it's being used and maybe even why it's being used in that way? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me uh, give sort of the general, generally what we're seeing across uh, most industries, uh, and then we can get into the use cases. Uh, we're we're seeing like three specific ways that AI is getting used. Right, the first one is uh, people are automating repetitive tasks. Uh, which often require very little cognitive effort. Uh, usually this is using robotic process automation. More and more we're seeing uh, intelligent process automation, which is uh, RPA plus uh, AI. So that, that's one area. The second is uh, we're seeing people generating previously unknown insights, uh, both from structured and unstructured data, uh, generally using virtual learning and deep learning. And then the third area that we're seeing more and more of uh, is how to amplify human intelligence by providing uh, contextual knowledge uh, and support uh, using natural language. Right? So this may be, this is sort of this paradigm that if you had a, if every employee had a uh, invisible friend who could answer any question and uh, recommend to them ideas on what they should do next. Uh, it, it's it's that kind of concept, right? So those are the three main categories. And Nathan, you want to talk about a few uh, uh, use cases? Sure. Um, so in in one of the cases, what we did, um, uh, you know, for one of the asset management firms, um, we built a. a you know, a research assistant for their sales and research analysts, right? What the platform did was uh, sourced uh, unstructured broker research uh, from broker uh, platforms, and then it also amalgamated uh, that information with uh, uh, structured information that was there within the organization, and also um, some of the notes that um, a research analyst would typically share uh, with them, right? And uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, together, um, we we created a sort of a knowledge graph, um, you know, and that knowledge graph enabled, um, you know, uh, very simple uh, ans uh, question answering mechanisms and also uh, fairly complex, uh, uh, you know, answering uh, some of the some some very complex questions as well. Um, 
you know, simple questions could be as as simple as, um, you know, what's the stock price uh, of of Google uh, as of today? In which case, uh, you know, that results in, in 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 a in a very structured query onto a structured data store. Um, to a very complex question, uh, like you know, what's the impact of uh, interest rate change uh, in India um, on um, you know Asian stocks? Uh, right now, uh, if if you if you look at the complexity of the question, uh, the, the second question, uh, there are several things going on there. Right, one uh, we are trying to understand. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, we we are going at um, at the research uh, material that was collated before and structured in the knowledge graph to understand what are the elements that should be considered. Um, you know, while we are trying to answer that question, uh, we are going against the ontology that has been created uh, that was created in the knowledge graph that would uh, resolve um, all the countries that are in Asia um, and then will correlate that information um, you know across the broker research uh, as well as uh, as well as uh, research analyst notes right and try to stitch uh, the information together to be able to answer that question right uh, so that's that's one um, you know experience we created um, and uh, the experience uh, not just was just not limited to uh, answering uh, you know Actual questions, but uh, it also enable uh, voice experience, right? Um, and uh, voice experiences, um, you know, uh, they they typically also keep in mind uh, uh, the, uh, the the conversation that has been going on, right? So it takes into account what was the previous question asked, um, you know, how the the current question that is being asked is related to the previous question, uh, because at times, uh, you know, the conversations are uh, the conversations typically evolve, right? Um, so the previous context is also important so you know while we uh, were trying to figure out um, how to answer the latest question being asked uh, we were taken to uh, we were taken to account the previous questions asked and the responses given right so that's one that, example i want to ask a, a little more about that because again tying in some of the earlier comments about the algorithms and and maybe being a little too literal like asking about the a specific stock price or a specific outcome um is does that talk to that that comment about asking about a specific question or specific outcome and thinking about that use case that you just articulated? Is that a situation where maybe they are thinking too narrowly? Or if I kind of back up a few levels, are we really talking about more of a maturity model where the first the first place that people step into is kind of thinking about how to address a very specific question and then they start broadening the um yeah. the way that they leverage it yeah yeah so i don't know uh, if i'm making so, sense there on the, no, the this, question this is absolutely this makes sense right so and this is how uh, typically ai platforms evolve right you start with a um, with a more uh, pointed question and then uh, you start building especially especially even knowledge graphs you continue to build higher levels of abstraction um, you know higher order of truth right um, because uh, you know inferencing is is uh, inference engines are built on top of uh, layers of facts right so you can continue to um, build on top and uh, you know the the uh, inference engine will start leveraging um, specific uh, you know layers of uh, um, uh, you know higher abstractions of truth right mm -hmm. so uh, you start with something simple and then continue to evolve so so is it so it sounds like it is somewhat related to a, almost a maturity model in the sense that enterprises start out looking to solve for very specific problems or outcomes but then maybe broaden that reach or broaden that perspective over time is that what you're seeing that's that's typically the case with uh, knowledge assistants or digital assistants um, when it comes to uh, comes specifically to um, you know driving insights right uh, from data that's a second class of problem i would say um, both uh, actually are part of the bigger uh, ai ecosystem but um, you know when it comes to ml algorithms people have very specific asks or specific desires uh, in terms of what they want to find from data in which case you may not see uh, that directionality right it's uh, that directionality is relevant uh, in the context of building uh, knowledge based assistance hmm. so I want to bring in um, 
one of the questions that that came in and again i encourage folks please submit your questions in the go to webinar control panel and we will infuse those into the conversation or address those as part of the q a at the end um, so one of the questions is what tools are available for mining useful data from unstructured data like emails comments and posts in chat box in chat boxes i think the question is there there's all of this unstructured data that's coming in a myriad of different ways. How do we start to get our arms around it? And are there tools or methods that can help us from an AI perspective to, to leverage that? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, sorry, go ahead, go. Prashant. Go ahead. Right. So, uh, so when it comes to um, drawing inferences from unstructured data, uh, you have natural language processing techniques. Um, you know, techniques that can help you uh, extract entity, uh, techniques that can help you uh, extract intent from a specific sentence. Right. Techniques um, that are available that will that that will kind of uh, uh, figure out which are the related terms uh, in a specific sentence or in a specific uh, paragraph right um, so so you use some of these techniques uh, to kind of uh, create the knowledge graph right um, and then um, the tools uh, you're talking about tools right so uh, you have Stanford NLP gate um, you know uh, open NLP uh, and, and so on and so forth these libraries are available for you to do uh, these things that I just mentioned like entity extraction uh, intent resolution um, you know ontology harvesting and so on and so forth mm. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, so there are also commercially available tools like uh, uh, Luminoso and Rainbird that can uh, help do that. But the key thing to look for in those is, is there an extensible concept net underlying it, right? So there are, uh, like concept net itself is a uh, open source uh, uh, graph of, uh, different types of concepts, verbs, nouns, and so forth that's underlying many of these technologies. And then ConceptNet is an open source version. Uh, Microsoft and Google have their own versions. I think Microsoft is called Enterprise Knowledge Graph and uh, things like that. And, and the key is if you have a starting point like that, and then as the uh, NLP is used to read new documents, then you can start adding to the uh, this starting point. And the concept net, for example, has 500,000 concepts in it already. So then you either match to one of the existing ones or you keep adding. That gives you a huge leap in terms of trying to understand uh, uh, this unstructured text data. Mm. You know, this is a great segue into our next question. Um, and it's a common question that I've heard, and I'm sure you hear it uh, commonly as well, which is when we think about these tools, when we think about the approaches um, that we use to delve into leveraging tools, there are kind of two general kind of schools of thought, if you will. There's the platform approach, use a platform, use it in many different ways. And then there's the best of breed approach pick whatever tool you need for that particular function and then find a way to stitch those together. So you might have a myriad of different tools that you're using versus maybe a single platform. And there are pros and cons to each of those. So let's let's talk about, it, about that a bit. Um, when should enterprises be thinking about the platform approach versus the best of breed approach? Yeah, so I think, uh... First of all, uh, we should clarify this, uh, the term platform, because uh, I think the way you're asking the question as a binary may not be uh, the best way to address the, address the issue, right? So if we say uh, the question is between uh, a single vendor versus best of breed, like a single, single vendor as is platform, that that's a well-formed question but you can also build a platform uh, uh, which is best of breed and plus some customization so, so I, th I think that if we take that first part which is single vendor versus best of breed to date uh, th there is no single vendor that solves all the problems that most companies are trying to solve 
So we haven't seen a, any company stick with a single vendor platform. Almost everybody is doing uh, some kind of uh, best of breed. So, so that's one part. The, the other thing I do want to uh, also mention is that even if you're doing best of breed, you should think of what you're assembling as a platform where uh, the platform uh, enables hundreds or thousands of applications uh, to be built on top of it, right? So, so that creates a very different mindset than what we have been doing in uh, IT and technology over the last 20 years. There's a single-minded focus on building applications rather than on building platforms. So are you saying the platform that the platform that you're seeing is essentially a culmination of a number of best of breed products and then that's used as the platform within the enterprise? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so if you look at uh, the different areas where trying to build a digital assistant, uh, like a enhanced version of a chatbot versus understanding uh, what we were just talking about earlier, the knowledge graph of a, a large data set of unstructured text versus machine learning. These are uh, these may not be addressed by the same uh, same vendor, but what you have to do is think of your uh, workflow. So if you say that for every time I'm going to build a model and then integrate it into an application. I have to go through these four big steps where I create uh, the data pipelines, manage the data, data quality, et cetera. Then I feed it into the uh, modeling process or we, where I create the model uh, and validate the model. Then I go into the governance process with the interpretability and so forth that we were talking about earlier and mm -hmm. eventually in monitoring it in production. You want to try and uh, do as much uh, as possible so that every step of those is self-service for the person doing it, right? Meaning if you have a data scientist creating a machine learning model, they shouldn't depend on IT to bring data together or some, they should, certainly shouldn't be waiting on procurement to get a high performance compute license available and so forth. And that, that bringing all those tools and automation together to build a, a quote unquote platform, which is underlying a best of breed, uh, really enhances what companies can do. Okay. Nitin, want to get your thoughts on this too. Yeah, so, um, so that's that's uh, you know that's the, that's the situation um, you know that uh, ecosystem is uh, evolving very fast uh, and and platforms uh, uh, you know are are still catching up uh, so you absolutely need to take a best of breed approach um, you know uh, at the at the org level um, however at the enterprise level you can think of creating a platform um, that uh, that is uh, you know that makes uh, uh, AI uh, at agility, uh, you know, enable agility in AI uh, deployments or ideas, right? And uh, and ensures uh, governance when it comes to model building or deployment. This might be a, a little um, trying to boil the ocean type of question, but when you think about those best of breed culminations that turn into platforms, are you starting to see some themes where certain best of breed components, not necessarily calling out specific tools, but maybe certain classes of tools come together um, into platforms. Do you tend to see any themes along those lines? Yeah, I, I think there's uh, a couple of themes that uh, stand out. One is if you take uh, machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, that, that kind of pattern, uh, there are two two types of things people are doing to assemble their platforms. One is uh, automate the engineering underneath those platforms so that the, like I was saying, the data scientists or machine learning engineers are independent of uh, infrastructure. So it's sort of a no ops uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is automating a lot of the uh, 
AI scientists or data scientists work itself, right? So if you take things like uh, feature tools or feature labs that can do uh, deep feature synthesis and deep feature selection, if you look at uh, di the different flavors of AutoML that can create the uh, deep learning architecture uh, uh, automatically, it's sort of like data science without data scientists uh, if you push it far enough. But uh, those are the two flavors of uh, automation uh, that we're seeing inside of the machine learning type platform. And then the other big area that we're seeing is, or, or two, I guess, one is uh, integrating uh, robotic process automation platforms like Blue Prism or EYPath uh, into that uh, in a seamless way. And the second one is uh, extraction of unstructured data and knowledge uh, based off of a, a bunch of models that are coming out of machine learning, creating a, a set of tools and APIs uh, around that. Mm. So I would say those are the four big components we're seeing. Okay. I, you know, I picked up on something that, that you said there, uh, Rashad, and, and it was kind of interesting. It, it almost sounds like driving toward democratizing the role of the data scientist, not to necessarily eliminate them, but rather to streamline the ability so that you don't need a data scientist to do everything. Do you see that kind of flowing into this or did I misread that? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. And the for the companies that are building these platforms, they can do about five to 10 times as many projects with the same data science team, right? So that's a massive upside. And there's two, two types of things going on there. One is because of the uh, automation, they, the data science team can go faster. So, you know, what that means is you need one fifth or one tenth the number of data scientists, which are hard enough to find. Right. And then the other thing is you don't, not everybody has to have a, uh, PhD in mathematics, you can create a team that has one of those people with four or five uh, developers that are retrained as machine learning engineers. Uh, and you, because so many other things are automated, that data scientist can lead a team uh, to do uh, many more models and model variations and things like that. Interesting. So where does open source fit into this? Because it's something that I often hear about in the same conversation. I mean, is it a significant component? Is it one of many different components? Um, how would you characterize where open source kind of fits into this conversation we're having on this question? Yeah, it, it, it's certainly a very large component. It's probably more than 50%. Uh, the uh, there's two two things driving that. One is uh, if you look at the uh, objectives of the major cloud providers like Microsoft, Google, they don't care whether you use their uh, proprietary uh, machine learning tools or not. What they care about is that you you use their cloud. Mm -hmm. So they've been incorporating as much open source as possible, as fast as possible. And they've been trying to make their stuff also open source, as you can see from TensorFlow and such. Uh, so, so in that way, it's uh, gaining, it's gained a lot of momentum. And I think the other piece is in academic circles, a lot of uh, research and models that get built are uh, published. And rather than recreating and researching that on your own, picking that up and going, uh, building on top of it has a lot of momentum as well. So between those two, uh, open source is a uh, big part of uh, these types of things. Right. Anything to add uh, to this before we move on to the next question? Yeah, so uh, as, as uh, Rashid like, rightly said, open source is, is one of the key enablers uh, to, to AI growth, uh, primarily also because, uh, you know, there is a There, is, there are research institutes uh, involved um, that are doing some uh, flash, right? Um, so yeah, uh, open open source is really key here. 
Okay. So we have another question uh, that came in. So can we augment data scientists with AI and get more data translators, people who are adept at finding insights? I think, um, Rashad, you were talking a little bit about that in terms of the number of projects, but it's maybe a little more poignant of a question. Yeah, I think that uh, in the same way that AI is going to affect uh, other fields where AI will take on more of the types of work that are being currently done, I think data scientists are not immune from that. So uh, like like that, like the auto ML, so uh, auto ML tools, if you look at uh, the two big things that data scientists spend uh, spend a lot of time on <laughs> if they don't have data issues itself <laughs> is uh, feature selection and creating the uh, neural net uh, the deep learning architecture like what sequence and how many uh, layers and so forth and both of those now have uh, automation capabilities now that doesn't remove the need for thinking it allows you to experiment faster but you still need to uh, know what you're doing but it, uh, you because you can do it faster you don't need as many data scientists to do the same work right so so it's augmenting in that sense for sure gotcha so just uh, real briefly uh, before we jump to the next question are you still seeing where the bulk of the time that a data, data scientist spends is still around sanitizing and organizing the data before actually getting into the modeling and the work, the, the core work that gets done with the data? Are you still seeing that that is, that is holding true? Yeah, I, I think for people who haven't uh, built their platforms uh, and they're still doing one of uh, applications and projects, uh, about 60% of data scientists time is going in actually managing the data. Mm. Uh, but for the people who have built the platforms, it's very little. They're almost off the bat starting off with feature engineering. Wow, that's a huge, huge change. Um, okay, let's get, let's get to our last question. We only have a few minutes left here. Um, and again, if you have any last minute questions for the audience, if you have any last minute questions, please get them in because um, we only have a few minutes left here. In our last question, um, Rashad, Denton, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the enterprise in regards to AI? You know, AI has been discussed quite a bit in the last few years especially. Um, what are some broad trends, and then maybe we can delve into picking a, picking a couple of those apart, that you're seeing with regards to enterprise adoption of AI? You know, there's three three things uh, that I'm saying, and Nathan, you can jump in after uh, I describe these uh, based on what you're seeing. But uh, the first one, I think, starting uh, mid last year, like prior to that, a lot of our discussions were around uh, building specific use cases or applications. But starting last year, the majority of our uh, clients and other people we're talking to, what they're trying to do is build these enterprise AI platforms, which is a, so people, the, all the discussion we we're having earlier, I can see that some of the leading companies are actually starting to jump into that. Mm. So that's, that's one area. The other is uh, people are starting to put together uh, AI center of excellence and build a federated model around it for the company. And that center of excellence is doing a few things. They're setting the standards, they're maintaining the relationships with academia and vendors, and uh, they're maintaining the platform and the processes around it. And most importantly, they're starting to put together the model governance uh, around the black box issue, often manifested as a model risk office, right? So all, all of these types of things tend to sit in a AI center of excellence usually. And then the th third one that we're seeing is, uh, you know, it's been around in other types of things, but in AI we're starting to see it more and more, which is people are, 
now starting to use not just the data that's available in the company, but uh, acquiring third-party data and integrating that uh, into their uh, modeling. So that, uh, and par I think part of that is because they want to do new models that were not doable with just their internal data. I think the other part is this, uh, talking about earlier in terms of the diversity of uh, objectives and hence the diversity of data needed. Yeah. Yeah, I just, just wanted to kind of add to that uh, at, at least one point there. Um, and, and that relates to, um, you know, this continuous need of leveraging alternative data. Um, and alternative data can uh, is, is essentially any any data that is still not being leveraged uh, by by competitors in general. Right. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, once once uh, people start realizing uh, value of a specific type of data in the industry, then you start losing that competitive advantage. Right. So essentially what you need is is data plat uh, uh, essentially a data platform um, that can enable, um, you know, agile ingestion, uh, transformation, um, data preparation, um, you know, capabilities um, in, in some sort of a self-service manner. Um, so, uh, you know uh, the, the tooling around that through which you can establish the value of the data uh, even before you start uh, integrating with your enterprise data assets right so having the right foundation of such data platform is also also kind of critical and that's something that we're seeing that organizations are investing in mm. so can, Nitin, can you maybe clarify a little further for folks that may not understand what you mean automating data not used by computers what do you mean by that uh, Can you give uh, some examples? So, yeah, so I meant alternative data. It's not, uh, you know, automated data. Alternative oh, data is any it. data that you don't directly relate to po uh, the potential outcome. Uh, so, for instance, uh, let's say you want to understand the economic activity uh, in the country. Maybe one of the ways of doing that could be to look at the parking lots of supermarkets. Right now, that's a you know very uh, uh, different way of uh, of uh, of assessing the activity, right? Um, because if the parking lot lots are vacant, uh, most probably people are not going to supermarkets, right? And mm -hmm. that that could be a good indicator, right? So that's just one instance. Uh, there are other instances, you know, like um, uh, in in one of the cases for an asset management firm, um, you know, we uh, leverage the LinkedIn uh, data. Uh, to identify who can be the next uh, uh, potential high net worth individuals, right? Mm. Using uh, using the the uh, the profiles of people and their uh, and and uh, people who are part of their networks. And this is this goes back to what Rashad was saying earlier uh, in the third item, right? Uh, having a strategy where you're starting to integrate that third party data into your yeah. modeling uh, to provide. Exactly provide yeah. greater insights. I mean, arguably for a long time, we've said that um, there, the enterprise has used data from outside, meaning it's really consumed data that it has not generated itself. And it just seems like we're doing that more and more. Let's, um, let's go ahead and jump to our Q&A. This has been a fascinating discussion. We've, we've got uh, one other question that I want to get in there. And if anyone has any last minute questions, definitely populate them in. Are there any labs or trial platform as a service available where persons can sandbox as a newbie or proof of concept without the large capex? I think the question is really more around where can I, is there a place where I can kind of play around with this and get started as I'm starting to, to venture down that, that path? Yeah, I think if, if you look at the large cloud providers like uh, Azure, AWS, Google, they all have a uh, sign up that allows you to use it free for a certain period. Uh, so Azure, for example, has a very easy to use uh, machine learning, traditional machine learning uh, platform that's initially free. If you want to go do deep learning, you can go to fastai.com. There are other places like fastai, but there you can use, I think, 10 hours of uh, compute time for free or something like that, uh, and then test out what the things you want to play around with. Great. Nitin, any other thoughts? 
no i think uh, russia has covered it um, right. you know just about every cloud vendor has uh, this kind of offering um, so perfect rashad nitin thank you so much this has been fascinating i already knew quite a bit about ai but even i'm learning a lot from this and i think the audience and those that will listen to this webinar um, afterwards, we'll also gain quite a bit from the conversation. So I want to say thank you so much uh, in sharing your thoughts and sharing your perspectives. Um, this is definitely one that will be good for folks, whether they're starting out in AI uh, from the enterprise or if they are uh, well engrossed in it and looking to go to the next level. So I think there's a good mix of, of something for everyone in this conversation. So Nitin, Rashad, thank you so much for taking part. Yeah, thank you, Tim. It was a thank great you. conversation. Thank you. And I want to thank the audience for your participation as well. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for your questions. Um, this is part of what makes this a very rich experience. Uh, we'll have this up for others to be able to access and listen. And with that, we're going to close down the webinar. Thanks again and have a great day.